How many of you have never heard me before? Oh, awesome. Some of you are just looking at me like this. <laughs> I'm free from me, which makes me free from you. <sighs> That's a really good thing. I got this picture while we were doing worship tonight. And I'll get back to that freedom thing because I've lived in it for 10 years. I was in bondage for my whole life. And I was victim to the fear of man and trying to impress people and trying to make you think that I was something that I wasn't. And that's, that's what the devil does. He tries to make people think he's something when he's nothing. I got a picture of an army in a, uh, and they were, they were fighting this battle and, and the, they were closing in. But the army was standing firm. And I got this picture of this general that was back in the back because general doesn't hang out front. At least today they don't. Back then they'd charge. Today they hang back. You know, you see Braveheart, he's on the front lines, man. Or you see generals in, in the, when you're fighting on horses or you watch Lord of the Rings, they're out front, you know. You might not watch that, but I have. They're pretty cool. And uh, I got this picture of this general. He's in the back and he's like really protected, really fortified and he's back behind all this protection and you got all the all the other fighters that are out there and no matter how hard the troops got hit like the general never got touched and so in the natural in an army who has more protection a private or a general general I mean it's obvious Even from that illustration it is but like in the body of Christ we've accepted a lie and we've said that different levels, different devils, that's not in your Bible. And the more you grow in Christ, the more you get attacked. That's not in your Bible either. The devil hates everybody that believes in Jesus. But we can develop a fear mentality and all of a sudden be weighed down by the issues of life and never understand why we're in this thing. And you can be a pastor for 40 years and still, still not have peace and been doing your job and in the trenches and you'll need a retreat to find a respite or you'll need a once a year gathering in order to get filled up and this will never keep you filled up. I just figure I'll start there. I'm not going to bring a message that's a bummer because the gospel's not a bummer. We're supposed to move from glory to glory, not bummer to bummer. Are you guys alright? I'm just going to pour out my heart, man. I promise this. I, I promise transformation. Because any kind of grace that doesn't lead to transformation is demonic. Because the grace of God transforms. But the grace of God has to begin in the place of rest. And if we don't stay in a place of rest, there's no way to make it. And you can't just proclaim to have rest. You actually have to be in rest. Because you'll never find rest from vacation. You'll never find rest from a retreat. You'll never find rest from a conference. You'll have a momentary emotional rest and a little bit of freedom at a conference or at a pastor's retreat, or whatever you would do once a year to gather. I've done lots of these, and I'm, I'm totally okay with doing them. But we need to establish a lifestyle of rest on a constant basis to where you're not drained from ministry. You're never supposed to be drained from ministry, and you're never supposed to need God to fill you back up again. I don't read any of that stuff in my Bible. It's not there. We've made books on it, and they're not real. You cannot have somebody pray for you to get filled back up. Your cup runneth over. You can't afford to give in ministry out of anything less than overflow. You can't afford to give out of something that you've learned. I've never studied the Bible to, to teach people. I've never read that thing to try to preach a sermon. I just can't do it. it it's, it's crazy to try to make a certain amount of points in a sermon. Not that you're not supposed to come up with sermons because pastors, you have to come up with them every week. I just came back from, I was just in Poland, I was just in Norway and Switzerland. I was there for one day in, one day back, and 10 days in between. In my 10 days there, I did 32 meetings. I mean, full on meetings, like full on. Not like one half hour, I'm talking hours and hours and hours of never ending gospel truth. But I. Since I've got born again, I've seen something different, and, and I believe it's the simplicity of this gospel that we've complicated. 
And I believe that when we complicate it, we have to come up with stuff to try to, to fill the time slot. But the time slot can be filled with a never-ending gospel that constantly flows out of a fountain that we have. And then as we minister, it's not about trying to get a word for somebody. It's about rivers of life-giving water that flow out of your belly on a constant basis. I don't do ministry. I do Jesus. I've never, ever tried to stir up the gifts. Like I'm, I'm saying, like, pray for what do you have for me today, Lord? I've just walked with him. I, I didn't know him, and then I did. Like, the mystery's been revealed. It's not, a, it's not a mystery anymore. The cat's out of the bag. Like, it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's really that simple. And, and sometimes when I talk, people hear, oh, well, you've been in it for 10 years. Well, let's, let's see how you do in 20 more. Well, people told me that when I first got born again. Let's see where you are in 10. Here I am. I'm more in love with Jesus today, and that's the key. See, I'm in love with Jesus. I don't, just, <clears throat> I don't just do conferences. I don't just go speak. I'm in love with Jesus. Every day, all day long, it never changes. I've always been in love since I got saved. I didn't know him, and I didn't see anybody that I wanted what they had in me. I didn't want what people that confessed to be Christians said they had because I didn't see anything worth value. And I think that a lot of the reasons is because the people look in the mirror and they don't see their own value and that's the problem. <sighs> I'm going to roll, man, and we're going to just go and I just want you to be okay with it. But please, if, if there's any kind of presumption inside about, about who's speaking right now, I'm in love with Jesus. And I promise you, that it is going to be like a Holy Spirit wrecking ball because He is so good. He takes out the trash so that there's none left. Like He's a trash taker at her. See, if there's a problem with the fire, it's not that God changed. If there's a problem with the flame, it's not because God changed. You as leaders have more protection than anybody. What's to make you think that if the army has more protection in this world, then leaders have less? No way! Man, we've got, like, God on our side. Like, if God be for us, who cares who's against us? If greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, what are we worried about? And why is this so draining? Listen, God has the spirit of counsel available for when you counsel. He's got the spirit of wisdom available for when you need wisdom. The spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him is what we really need. Because what people are looking for is him. Amen. What we need to do is give him him. When someone comes up to me and asks the question, they just need him. It's not complicated. Look, I, I, I am on this inner strengthening course. Because the Bible says, be strengthened in your inner man. And I've been going after that thing. And I've been being strengthened in my inner man. Like core training of the gospel. Since I got saved 10 years ago. I mean, I came out of 22 years of addiction and atheism and anger and hatred. I grew up in the Masonic homes. And then after I got out of there, I... I joined the military to straighten my life out. Nobody ever told me about Jesus, man, my whole life. I went in the military, and then I went to boot camp, went AWOL, ran away. Out in Colorado, hid in the mountains, a pipe dream. Get arrested out there, get shipped back across America. Get put in the brig. I'm in the brig for eight and a half months. Then I get out of there, and I'm waiting for my discharge. They didn't come, so I went AWOL again. The Marines don't like that. <laughs> I had a severe authority problem. I was a basket case. I've been in through psychologists, all kinds of different stuff. Nobody could fix me. They tried to get inside my head, tried to fix what was wrong in me. What was wrong was I was separated from God. That was the real answer. I was separated and, and, and when I got born again, I wasn't. But that relationship intensified after I got saved. This is an amazing, amazing privilege that we have to be able to represent him in a lost and dying world. I don't just like, I don't, I don't do ministry. I can't stress that to you enough. I do Jesus, but that's, that's for every pastor, apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher. It's for every, well, all of the fivefold gift is for us to manifest Jesus. All cre are you guys okay? Can I walk down there? Is it legal? I, some man, you don't understand. Some places they keep me in a little box. I can't even turn sideways. <laughs> Sorry, I drink large amounts of water. 
Thanks, buddy. When I, when I, I got busted again and got extradited back to the Marine Corps base, and then eight and a half months later after that one, they weren't going to like keep me in. They kicked me out and gave me a bad conduct discharge. So everything was bad on my whole like, life. I couldn't get jobs. You can't write that on your applications. People don't want to see that stuff. Fill out your resume. Oh yeah, I was, uh, <laughs> that doesn't work. Got a bad conduct discharge from the military. Yes, I need the job. So I came out, couldn't get jobs, quit, got fired, just made a mess of my life. No Christians interrupted my path the whole time. And I'm not kidding. And now granted, I was a thief. Granted, I was scary. But those are the kind of people that I think Jesus would have walked up to. Matter of fact, I know they would have followed him without food for days. Because Jesus, they followed. We are to be imitators of Christ. Imitators of Christ. And walk in love. That's what we're to be. This thing is all about love of God. It's not about anything else. It's not about big churches, although God's not afraid to have a big church. But we can't worship programs. We need to worship Him, because He's everything. We all have the ability to walk just like Jesus walked. My heart's overwhelmed right now, okay, because I'm trying to keep from crying because I'm looking out there and I'm seeing God's champions. You guys have an amazing opportunity to change the world. And sometimes we allow life to potter and squeeze us, situations to squeeze us and mold us. And you know, you pour into people and they don't get it. You pour into people and they don't get it. The key factor to them not getting it is them not learning to pursue it themselves. Because as pastors and leaders, you're not meant to keep your people fed. The pressure's off. It's true. You're not their savior, Jesus is. But he comes and he makes his home inside of them and the Holy Spirit becomes a teacher. And then he teaches and trains them and it says you need no one to teach you. In 1 John 2, 27. You need no man to teach you for you have the anointing that teaches you all things, all things that are true. He's the teacher, he's the one. It's God the Father, God the Son, and it's not God the Holy Bible. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, the Holy Bible is not understood. But when the Holy Spirit comes, when the anointing of God comes into a person's life, when they're taught that they should pursue that, and us as leaders not be scared for somebody to get it, like to get that Holy Spirit and be like, yeah, you can do it. Because sometimes we don't want to be, you know, hey, careful. We don't want you to go off track, man. I mean... People told me since the beginning of my life, this is a marathon, not a, or a marathon, not a sprint. But I couldn't find that in my Bible either. It's not in the Bible. You can't find it. It's not even in the Message Bible. It's not. It's not. It's not a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's a race. It's a race. You can't run the race without the Holy Spirit. You'll burn out. You won't make it. Holy Spirit's the key to everything. He's like the key. Yeah. Like the key. Like Jesus said, you know, I can't do anything without him. He said the son can do nothing of himself in John 5, 19. What he does, he does it because the father does it. For what the father does, the son does in like manner. Jesus said, I can do nothing of myself. Jesus Christ, the one that we worship, said he couldn't do anything without the Holy Spirit. <laughs> what makes us think we can do anything without him? What are we thinking? I remember the revelation that God gave me one time I was pumping gas. And God said to me, you know you can't even pump gas without me. <laughs> that was really awesome. That's like a deep revelation. Imagine if you knew that you couldn't even pump gas without Holy Spirit. Imagine that. Imagine if he just talked to you about the person on the other side of the pump instead of being frustrated about the price of gas. Imagine that. Man, oh. Jesus, help me. Help me make it simple, God. So I met this girl. We moved in together a year and a half out of the Marines. Moved in together, tricking into thinking I'm a cool guy. End up getting sales jobs because I can lie on the apps. They don't care. They just pay a commission, some of the sales things out there. So... 
I could manipulate, maneuver. Really, I was a professional liar. My whole life, a professional liar. Like, the worst of the worst. Man, God, he's just waiting patiently for me. <laughs> God, whew, the world's going to really freak out when I touch this one. <laughs> he, he loves that. He loves that. I thank God that he does. I thank God that when I look at the disciples, they were nobodies. They didn't have anything. They were fishermen. They, they didn't have a clue. They were untrained and uneducated men. But they realized they'd been with Jesus. <laughs> That's so awesome. You know, I, I, for 34 years, I never read a book I couldn't read. So I never read a book because I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't comprehend what I was reading. So I, I just didn't bother reading. I'd skim through, find the answers, whatever I had to do. But I didn't want to read because I couldn't remember anything and it really bothered me. So I get, I get, I'm talking like four pages in and can't even believe that my eyes are still going on the words. Does anybody ever have that problem? Anybody? No, pastors don't have that problem. I did and it was bad. Really bad. So, my, my girlfriend and I were together for about a year and a half, and then we had a daughter. When my daughter was born, I realized I could never be a dad, because I didn't know how to be a dad, because my dad wasn't there, and I definitely didn't know who dad was. I didn't know who God was, so I had no idea how to be one. So, in a, a few months, she wanted to leave. So, I was suicidal, where I killed myself, threatened to do it. Then a few months after that, she said, I'm going to find somebody else to take care of me. You're a loser and a liar. I hate you. A couple months later, I said, I'll kill you and kill them and kill myself. And I thought that way my whole life. I went to psychologists. I went to doctors. I went to the nut ward. I went everywhere to try to figure out what was wrong with me. I went through AA. I went through NA. I did it all. Everything. Man, I tried everything. I tried Buddhism. I tried reincarnation. I had the Book of Shadows. I did the whole Wicca thing. I did it all. None of it satisfied my heart. Nothing satisfied my heart. Ever. I was addicted to pornography. My whole life was just a wreck. I was addicted to everything. Everything. And so for seven and a half years, my daughter grew up that way with an animal as a dad. And then one night I come back and she's gone. Took my daughter, left. Seven and a half year old kid, nine years into a relationship. Almost nine years in. I went over to her stepdad's house to get a rifle and on the way to the gun cabinet, I passed by a notepad. I was gonna make my suicide letter and I opened a phone book. Just flipped it open by chance. I made a check in this thing, it opened to churches. I drove to this church. I was angry and didn't understand why I was even driving there. God did, but I did. I get to this church and I meet somebody. And his name's Dan Moeller. I met him that day. And I couldn't even look in his eyes. Because there was something so real in there. See, because the eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eye is single, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is not single, if it's not one purpose, then it's not light. It's darkness. How great is that darkness? And you have the capacity to house light. And how you see is everything. But how you see yourself is priority. Because when I look in the mirror, I have to see what God sees. Because if I don't see what God sees, I'm waiting for somebody to tell me. And I need to look into the mirror and see what my Father sees. Because all creation is groaning and waiting for you to manifest your Father. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, how old you are in the Lord. All creation is groaning for the sons of God and the daughters of God to be made manifest. Meaning all creation is waiting for you to manifest Jesus. All creation and how that's manifested is through an intense relationship with a father whose name is love. And the Holy Spirit that empowers that and makes it active in one's life. And all creation is waiting for that. And sometimes we're waiting for a feeling, God touched me. Man, God did what he did 2,000 years ago. If you need touched, you might get touched by the wrong God. The wisdom of the world is sensual and demonic. 
It's sensual. It's full of your, it's, it's feeling oriented and it's demonic. It's strategy set up, demonic strategy set up to deceive people. And it says it's, it's full of envy and self-seeking and everything evil. It doesn't say some. It says everything evil is in there. Everything. Envy. Man, I wish I had your job. That's envy. And people say, well, I wish you, I did what you do. That's envy. You can't be in that place. Because if you wish that somebody else was do that you had somebody else's job, it's because you don't see your creative value and you don't understand who you are. This is, the, this is the hardest thing for pride to get, I promise you. Because pride doesn't want to be told anything, because pride thinks it knows it all, but spins out of, out of control, doesn't understand what real grace is, and cannot walk in real mercy, and real mercy. And all of a sudden, we're just hurting people that know it all. But really, it's not about knowing it all, it's about knowing Him. Because all good gifts come from the Father of lights, and you are the lights that He's the Father of. Are you all right? Are we good still? A little? I got to get to the point when I'm saved. Because <laughs> I was as lost as lost could be, man. And I saw something in Dan's eyes. I, I, saw, I saw love. I saw the reality of it. I was like, dude. I was telling him my stuff. He says, yeah, I, I get it. I understand. You're not even listening to me, man. He said, oh, I am, but what you're telling me isn't helping you. I'm like, ugh, frustrated. Because he's all happy, and I have nothing to be happy about. And he wasn't laughing at me. He had this joy inside of him that nobody could take away. And you know what he was? I know what he was now. He was a people's pastor, and he spent nine hours a day on the phone counseling people. And he had that joy. Nine hours a day, on the phone, on the phone with trauma, all day long, every day. And all he did was drill stuff with truth, like a machine. I never heard anything like it. I would sit there and when I'm telling him my stuff and he's just, he said, okay, listen. He said, since you don't want your life, why don't you give it away? I'm like, who would want this life? And why would somebody that died 2,000 years ago want my life? So he shared the cross. I'm like, fine, whatever. He can have it. Fine. That was my prayer. That was it. He said, amen. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> so be it. So be whatever. But it was enough for a seed to get in there. So I, I, he told me, here's my number. You're going to need it. Make sure you call me soon. I went home, called my daughter. I told her, tell mommy that daddy found God. She said, what's he like, daddy? I said, I don't know. So powerful. But I saw him in somebody today. <laughs> the eye is the lamp of the body. It says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. That's what it says. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy and thieves can't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Colossians says, set your mind on things above and not beneath. Ephesians says that I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. It actually says to boldly approach the throne of grace in time of need. When's the last time you didn't need Jesus? So why don't you just live in the throne room? That doesn't mean be so heavenly minded that you're a flake. That means be so heavenly minded that you're earthly incredible. People have to have more of you around them. So I put my daughter to bed that night. My girlfriend was so mad at me. She's like, now you're going to be a hypocrite. No, no, no. Everything's going to change. That night, hour and a half after I put my daughter to bed, told her never again, out on a crack bench first night. First night, there was something that needed to happen more than just a seed to come in. See, I never read before, and the Bible was something that I wasn't about to open. I didn't understand the necessity. Dan kept telling me that the Bible is your only way, that you need to understand this is what you need to do. 
You just need to open it and say, God, I have no clue. And I'm like, oh. I'm like, yeah, but like, I'll just listen to you. <laughs> Which is the problem in Christianity. I promise you. The problem is taking everybody else's word for it. And in the days that we're in right now, people are heaping up for themselves teachers because they have itching ears. And false grace and fake grace is out there right now. And it's destroying people. And it's saying that God's okay with every kind of sin and everything. And that's just demonic wisdom. Strategy set up to take Jesus' face and rub it in the dirt. And say, here's my king. That's not grace. Grace empowers you to walk out what the truth of the Bible calls you to. The spirit of grace and truth was upon Jesus. It's awesome. So that first night, I'm out on a crack binge. Boom. Second night, boom. Third night, boom. Again, calling Dan every morning. Dude, I did it again. If, if God loves me, then why am I doing this? Well, Todd, God doesn't like hold you by the neck and make you do things. We should. It'd be easier. You know what he said? Then it wouldn't be a fight of faith. Like, ah, ah, I'm frustrated. Five and a half months of that went by. Going to church on Sunday saying I'm sorry for all the stuff I've done. Five and a half months later, I'm out in a drug deal one night. Pick up some kid from New York City. He's down in my city. Tell him I'm a cop. Rip him off. Got all the drugs in my hand. Tell him to get out of the car. And when he gets out of the door, I hit the gas to get away, and he unloaded a 9 millimeter at me from 10 feet away. As soon as my cars went, I heard a voice say, I took those bullets for you. Are you ready to live for me yet? Well, I, I thought I was going crazy. So I went and did all the drugs. And then I couldn't get high all night long. So that was really crazy. But the voice wouldn't go away and it was trapped inside my head. Echoing constantly, it wouldn't go away. So I went home that night, no bullet holes in my car. Went up to my door, my girlfriend, I hate you, get out of my life. <laughs> Three days later, I go to a place called Teen Challenge. I go to Teen Challenge, which was started by Dave Wilkerson, you guys probably know that. I went in there, I, I enlisted for 12 months to go in there. My girlfriend was glad I'm out. My daughter is sad because I'm her only dad, as bad as it was. I was up for, for two months and I had these three nights where I had these dreams where I encountered Jesus in Teen Challenge. Two months into a 12-month program. Now, I quit everything in my life, so it wasn't looking good on, the, on, that, on that side of things. But the first scripture that opened up to me was in James. It was a month and a half in. The scripture that says, if anybody lacks wisdom, ask God. And, and I'm in the prayer room because I went in every morning. I opened my Bible an hour before the thing started every day. And I got into the Bible and had no idea what I was reading all day, all the time. Went through classes, had no clue. They want me to memorize scripture. Uh, my brain is so fried from drugs, man. I couldn't memorize it. I really, index cards. Okay, okay. I, I, I would study it for 10 minutes. All right, okay, all right. Where'd it go? <laughs> and that's really, honestly. But I saw that scripture in James. It says, if I lack wisdom, ask God. And, and as soon as I read that scripture, I'm sitting down on the couch. And I said, oh, oh my God, that's it. Oh, I don't have a clue. I'm clueless. I don't have any wisdom. That's it, Jesus, that's it. I don't have a wisdom at all. It's still, still the same today. It's been 10 years. And this is where I live. I, don't, I lack wisdom. See, if you think you have it, then you don't need His. But the wisdom from beneath is self-seeking, envious, sensual, demonic. The wisdom from beneath needs to be heard to make itself feel good. The wisdom from the world, the wisdom from beneath is the kind of wisdom that when I share something from a pulpit, if you like it, then I feel good inside. That's demonic strategy. 
It is set up to get you to tell people what they want to hear instead of the truth. That one felt good. It is good. The wisdom from the world. See, self I'm trying to, I want them to appreciate me, so I'm going to tell them stuff from the pulpit, maybe to have more members at my church. And I'm not being mean, I'm being real. Because if you preach righteousness, that's right, you preach righteousness and bear the fruit thereof righteousness, people want that. I found that everywhere I go, people want raw truth. They want real truth. They don't want, they don't want games. They don't want, man, I'm, I've been all over the world and I preach and, and I'm not boasting in the, how many places I've been, but everywhere I go, I find out, especially the young people, man, they want raw truth. They're tired of just history. They want truth. They want raw truth. They want radical stuff. They want to do the miraculous, but if they don't get trained to go in the Word and to go in there themselves and have personal relationship, they'll do the miracles and they'll get their validation from the miracles and the healings and stuff. And they'll gain who they are through what they do instead of what He did. And real grace empowers real truth to happen. You're supposed to be supernatural every day, all day long. You're not supposed to be afraid of it. You're supposed to walk like Jesus walked. Jesus never took glory to Himself. I can't do a miracle in my own strength. That's ridiculous. I've had so many people say, well, I don't believe in that. And they get healed anyway. I'm not, I'm not threatened by people. I love my father. I've been on planes at, and you should see what happens. In elevators and people can't wait to get off the elevator. <laughs> I'm just not intimidated by anybody. But I'm in love with my father. I've done crusades with Reinhardt and those guys in Africa. I've preached to 800,000 people. And I've preached, I just came back and did a, man, crazy meetings in Europe. Amazing. On fire. But every day, I'm before an audience of one. Every day. That's where my life is. My life is here. My life is here. It's God help. I'm on the plane today. I'm like, help. I'm serious. It's a business guy beside me. I said, how you doing, man? He says, all right. I said, man, I just got to tell you that God loves you so much. He's like, well, thank you. I said, no, so I'm serious. <laughs> and I shared my testimony with him, and he's like, what? I've never been beside somebody like this. <laughs> and self-righteousness can creep in. And you can think that you didn't have nothing to be forgiven of, and I had so much to be forgiven of. See, regardless of who you are, pastor, don't matter. You've been in church all your day, every day of your life. If you broke one law, you broke them all, period. God's standard is holiness. See, the, my problem is that I know I've been forgiven, and I believe it. My past has never had a voice in my life. Therefore, condemnation and guilt and shame has never been in my life for 10 years. Not one day. Ever. I haven't been offended by one person in 10 years. Not ever. People are like, oh, well, you just don't, you're not around the people I am. <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> you step out and start talking about Jesus everywhere you go and you see what kind of confrontation you get. But why would I be threatened? If God is for me, who, who cares who's against me? And I'd rather, see when someone screams at me, they're just groaning. They're waiting for me to manifest my father because all creation's groaning. You scream in my face, you're just groaning. I don't care, you can yell at me and hit me. You can't kill me because I'm never gonna die. I really don't, I, I really think this way. People know me, you guys know me. I, I just, I, I just, I'm not afraid. You cannot hurt me. I'm in love with Jesus. You can cuss me out, spit in my face. I love you. I don't want anything from you. See, love doesn't say I love you. Come on, do you love me? Come on, tell me. Love doesn't say I love you. Tell me back. Now hurry. So I feel good about telling you. It's called needing the praise of people. So now I need the praise of people to keep me sustained. If I live by the praise of men, I'll die by the criticism of men. Therefore, you only tell people what they want to hear because you'd be afraid you might 
ruffle feathers. And God forbid you lose an elder that doesn't believe in the supernatural. So you don't want to step out in it because you're afraid they might, they might kick the system. Boy, I'd, <laughs> I'd love to be in those meetings because it doesn't matter what people think. Jesus is Lord. See, I'm going to stand before God one day and he's going to say, well done. He's not going to see compromise in my life. Because when I sold out, I just sold out. I pushed it all to the center. We need to come back to purpose. Come back to the reality of why we're in this thing. Are we in this thing for any other reason than to worship Him, love Him? Because that's what it's all about. You shouldn't be okay just when you worship. Your life should be worship, spirit and truth. Every day of your life, you worship God with everything you are. Because it's not about you anymore, it's about Him. And he's amazing, and he thinks you're just like him because he created you in his image. Come on, man. It's really good. <sighs> so, so I'm in Teen Challenge for two months. I have these three nights. A week after I had, about half a week after I had that encounter with that wisdom word. It's three nights, and then Jesus tells me to go home. So I go downstairs and tell them I'm leaving. That's not going over well at all in a 12-month program with a bunch of addicts. But I was free. And so I called Dan. He came up and picked me up. We drove, we drove home. First we stopped at the church. Then I stopped at my house to see my daughter. So I had to tell her how sorry I was because I messed her whole life up. And I realized for the first time in my life that I was a dad. <laughs> a dad. I never been a dad before. Seven and a half years, I pretended to be a dad, but it was fake. But now I had an encounter with my father. So now I was gonna be a real dad. My daughter comes running, hey you, hold my kid. I said, daddy loves you so much, I'm so sorry. She goes, for what daddy? I said, for all the stuff, honey. Kids are so forgiving, you know. And I'm like, no, 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 listen, I need, cause I need to, I need to like make restitution, I need, to tell her, you know. I'm trying to tell her, but she's not listening to me. Daddy, I'm just glad you're home. I said, honey, daddy's not home. Daddy's out, but he's not home. She said, no, daddy, this is your home. I said, no, honey, this is not my home. This is where daddy used to live. It was horrible things that I did here. Daddy's sorry. I need to tell mommy I'm sorry. She goes, daddy, I just love you. I'm like, oh my gosh, I love you too. She seriously doesn't remember what I'm saying I'm sorry for. My daughter. See, we think this is way out of the box. There's no way she'll have to go through all kinds of healing and years and years of trying to get all these things out of her. But what if the blood of Jesus is better? What if the blood of Jesus is what cleanses all those dead works out of our conscience? What if the blood of Jesus cleanses the conscience from dead works in order for us to serve God? What if that's a greater reality? What if we've made it psychological instead of supernatural? See, because my daughter's living proof. All the memories were wiped out. So my girlfriend comes out of the house and I told her how sorry I was. She said, I know you are. When you went away, I gave my life to Jesus. Oh, it's pretty amazing. I am so convicted because I know where my life was with her and how twisted it was. And I can't move in to the house. I said, I cannot live here. We're not married. She goes, I know you can't. We need to be married. I looked at Dan. I said, what's going on right now? <laughs> See, Dan is a preacher of righteousness. Dan has been preaching the blood of Jesus to my family. My daughter, at seven and a half years old, had her memory supernaturally erased by the blood of Jesus. So my girlfriend and I, right there on the porch, decided that we were going to get married. And we got married in between first and second service on Sunday. Four days later. She's been my wife for ten years now. It's pretty amazing. It is. Our oldest daughter is 18. She doesn't have any memory still of anything before Christ. 
all that, I hate your father, your father's loose. She doesn't remember any of it. People still tell me, well, that's a mental block. It'll come up someday. I'm like, keep your psychology. <laughs> really. And if you're going to bring psychology in, make sure it's supernatural. Don't go fishing for something. Make sure the Holy Spirit is telling you. Don't go into someone and try to fix them inside, try to find out what the problem could be. Because you'll leave them worse off than when they started. Because I've met thousands of people that are tormented because they believe something inside of them still needs fixed. They need a revelation of the blood of Jesus. That's what they need. I promise you, it's that simple. It's that simple. Gosh, that feels good. Because that's the only thing there is. It's all we got. We've complicated it, man. So the Bible says, it says, be diligent to enter into his rest. Cease from your work, cease from your striving. It says, today, if you, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. And we know that. And the children of Israel, and they're out there, and their hearts are hard. And God's speaking. There is a place where Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened down, weighed down by the issues of life. Come to me and I will give you rest. He will give us rest. There's a place where we come to Jesus and we say, Okay, God, I give my life to you. And he gives you immediate rest. And that rest wipes away, washes away all your junk. And you are a regenerate spirit. Your, your spirit's regenerate, born again. Y'all believe that, right? Because it's in the Bible. All right. Some people don't. We just, then they get born again and then they do. Then he says, take my yoke upon you. And it talks about his burden being light, his yoke being easy. He says, and you will find rest. You will find rest for your soul. So first you have rest. You come to him and I will give you rest. So he gives you rest. And that's like that emotional freedom when somebody says yes to Jesus. And when I said yes to Jesus that first time, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I didn't want to kill myself. There was a seed in there. But there is the nurturing of the soul to have rest in the soul and to make sure that your soul finds rest. So if your mind, your will, your emotions don't stay in a place of rest, you will be in a place of stress. I know this sounds like something that everybody knows, but the more I travel, the more I talk to people, it doesn't matter what walk of life they're in. Worry is the dominant thing in the body of Christ, whether it be a pastor, a prophet, an apostle. I, I, I talk to everyone. So worry, and the answer to worry is in Matthew 6.33. So he talks about the birds of the air, consider the birds. It's right after Matthew you know, where we're in Matthew 6, 22, the, the eye is the lamp of the body, right? Right before that, Matthew 5, 19. Or, uh, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, let me read it out. I think it's 6, 19, sorry. Bear with me, I just came back from Europe. <laughs> this is Monday night. Are you guys Okay. Well, I just, yeah, I'm sorry, 619. I'm just, I read Matthew 5 through 7 a lot because it's who I'm supposed to be because it's the be attitudes. It's the attitude of being. When I read Matthew 5 through 7, I find out who I be. It's not what I do. It's who I be. See, it's being to do, Right? So when we come into rest, we, we become these things. Jesus says, come to me. So once we come to him, why don't we just stay with him? Life comes and smacks us, man. And sometimes we, we're reading this thing just so we can get something to teach. And that's, that, that's a striving to get a word. And people always ask me, Todd, what, what's the Lord saying? He's saying the same thing he always said. I, don't, I just don't have it. I don't get that stuff. What's the new thing? Uh, the new thing is, behold, I'll do a new thing. <laughs> yeah, but like, 
I'm like, yeah, but that's what you said last time. I said, did you get it? <laughs> Not really. Okay, let's hit it again. So we pound identity from a hundred different angles. Boom, boom, boom. And you tie so much truth in the soul that lies can't exist. And then all of a sudden you have a no occupancy or occupied right here. No vacancy sign. In other words, there's no room at the end when the lies come. See, rest for my soul means that the truth of who God is sets its home up in my soul so that every lie that tries to get in, it has no access to my soul because it's occupied. See, a stronger one, I know he uses the example of, of you know, the demonic and he says when a spirit leaves. He says then, you know, he goes through dry places then he, he comes back with seven others to see if the house is swept clean. And if it's not occupied, then seven worse move in. I would like to tell you that he's not just talking about devils leaving. But if truth is set up there, it is the stronger one. And that armor cannot be stripped. But if truth isn't set up there, this is the dilemma in the whole body of Christ, guys. I truly believe in my heart that the transformation of the mind is the key to Jesus, is the key to Christianity, is that our mind gets saved. Are you with me? Say, may the God of peace sanctify you completely, spirit, soul, and body. So the three parts of man getting saved. Your spirit, born again. Your body, healed, but also becoming one flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. And then your soul, your mind, will, and your emotions. The transformation of the mind is everything. But the transformation of the mind doesn't come from memorization. The transformation of the mind comes from Holy Spirit <sighs> breathing on the word, you walking it out, knowing it, and it becomes yours. Then you will know the truth, experience the truth, and that truth will set you free. Are you with me? Okay. <clears throat> it says, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, thieves break in and steal, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust, nor, moth, nor, I'm sorry, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so then if your eye is clear or single, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth or mammon. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life, as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither reap nor sow or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of much more worth than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor spin. Yet all of Solomon and all of his glory wasn't arrayed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. Your heavenly Father already knows the things that you need. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Gosh, I love that. So he talks about the birds, and he talks about their value. And he says, of, of how much more value, or of how much more worth are you than they? I found that an overwhelming majority of the body of Christ hears the voice, you're worthless. Whether you're in leadership, or whether you're just a layman, it doesn't matter. I, I hear that same voice, and that is what the enemy says every day. Because he's worthless, he's depressed, he's angry, he's bitter, he's ashamed. He's in unforgiveness, and there's no hope for him. So he is trying to reproduce his mindset in the body of Christ, in our soul. He's trying to reproduce how he thinks in the body of Christ. So that we can have a Christian confession, but no life to back it up. He loves for us to praise Jesus and then worry on a constant basis. 
He talks about birds and their value, and that needs to be where we start. Because our value has to be determined by the price that was paid for us. Christ and Him crucified. I mean, we weren't redeemed with silver or gold. The Bible says that we were redeemed, we were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. Sometimes we've, we've said that we've known the blood of Jesus, but the blood of Jesus needs to hit the soul of man for our mind to be cleansed from all dead works. And the reality of our life needs to be where Paul's was. When he spoke and he said, all the things that I've learned, I've counted them as dung for the sake of knowing him. So if there's one thing that we can get out of this whole session tonight, it's just knowing him. Because that's where everything flows. That's where you constantly are filled up and you don't need prayer for somebody to refill you. Boy, Todd, you've poured out. I'm going to pray for you that you get filled up. You can't do that for me. You can pray for me. That's amazing. But you are not filling my tank. If I don't have relationship and intimacy with God and I don't have my quiet time with God, not just reading my Bible. It's not just about reading my Bible and that's my quiet time. That's not quiet time. I'm being still and asking the Father to speak. Faith doesn't come by reading. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So God speaks by His Word, through His Word, but the Holy Spirit, He just brings it and He makes it real and He makes it life. Jesus has come to give us life and that we'd have it more abundantly. That life is a violently excessive life filled with truth empowered by the spirit of grace, man. Where we have a relationship with the, spirit of, with the spirit of truth that Jesus said, you know what? Don't worry, the one that's with you will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. And you cannot afford to look in a mirror and be an orphan. You can't afford to look in the mirror and not see what God sees. He's our father. He's not our bellboy. He's not a bellhop. He's not here to just meet all your needs. Sometimes we believe, we say things like, the Lord's here to meet all your needs. He's not a need meter. He's a life giver. He's not here to just meet our needs, man. We can't just go to him needs driven. I've never gone into my bedroom and except for anything but to ask God to reveal himself to me. Man, I remember the first whole year of my Christian walk. I was in Ephesians 1. I couldn't get out of it. It's like all I could read. I'm like, oh my goodness, God, you want to give to me the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. And this is all about knowing him. He wants to get, like God made it easy. He gave to me and wants to give to me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's like awesome. Do you know, in, in 2 Corinthians 14, 2, it says this. It says that God leads us in a victory parade. That's what it says. He always leads us in triumph. And through us, He diffuses the, the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. That means that every time I get squeezed, I'm like a Christian air freshener, baby. It's true. The more attitude people get, the more Jesus they get on them. Unless we got attitude ourselves. And we think with the wisdom of man. Can't afford to think that way. I always tell people, I use the example because it's easy. I heard it from Dan. It says when you squeeze an orange, what kind of juice comes out? Orange juice. When you squeeze an apple, what kind of juice comes out? If you squeezed an orange into a cup and you drank it and it was apple juice, what would you think? That is weird. And it should be equally as strange that when a Christian gets squeezed, everything but Jesus comes out. The devil should take a risk when he touches you. Oh, I promise. Go ahead and touch. Oh, see, I prayed this. People say, well, they don't do that. That's a dangerous prayer. Why? I'm not afraid. When's the last time you prayed for patience? <laughs> You know the patience is the key to like, like being perfect? I promise. James says that trials, they produce patience. And patience, let it have its perfect work so that you can be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's the Bible, man. The Bible says when patience has its perfect work, you'll be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's awesome. 
It's no wonder nobody prays for it. <laughs> you know what patience is? The first fruit of love. Because the first thing love is, is patience. And the only way to get patience is through trials, baby. Welcome to Christian maturity. People say, Todd, how did you grow so much in 10 years? I welcome the trials. Oh, I've been in a lot. I welcome them. You cannot squeeze my Jesus out of me. You can't even reject me. You know why? Because you didn't accept me. I promise, man. There's nothing you can do to take this away from me. I'm not just popping off. I live with me. I'm telling you the truth. If I'm accepted in the beloved, how can a person take away what they never gave me? Unless we don't believe that we've been accepted in the beloved. The first place it has to start is your value, your worth. You have to see yourself the way God sees you. You can't afford to see yourself for less than how he created you to be. And if the devil tells you something that you're not, you don't rebuke him and command him to get behind you. You thank God for who you really are. I've learned this, man. The devil's constantly trying to get you to turn around and rebuke him. Why would you turn around and tell him to get behind you? He's already there. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, taking every thought, every thought, everything that rises itself up against the knowledge of Him, you take it captive. If you don't take them captive, you cannot diffuse the fragrance of the knowledge of Him because you have thoughts that rise up against the knowledge of Him. You have to take them captive. You have to know what is and what is not God. And the only place that happens is on your knees, in your bedroom, or in your prayer, wherever you're going to pray, wherever you're going to seek God. I got a job and I worked as soon as I came out of Teen Challenge and I was working 40 to 60 hours a week. And I found time to spend with God. I would come home and where people want to relax and sit in front of the TV and watch a bunch of nothing. I just go back in my bedroom, shut the door, and cry. Say, God, help me understand who you say I am. Please, God. It's today, same. I'm hungry to know him. And the more I do know him, the more I realize I don't. But I do, but I don't. You know what I mean? I'm content with who I am in God. But I'm not satisfied. I have to have more. And he said, I can have as much of him as I want. It's not, I must decrease and he must increase. That's not okay for you to say that. Because you can never decrease enough. And, and actually change it. Say, I must die so that I can live. Because it's not about decrease. John the Baptist said, I must decrease and he must increase. John was saying that I and the law must decrease. And Jesus and righteousness and truth must increase. It was the changing of covenants. It has nothing to do with you. It's not about you decreasing. It's about you dying to live. He who seeks to save his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will find it. The key to overcoming the enemy is what? The blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and we love not our own life unto death. That's the key. Because if that's not in there, you can't overcome it with just the blood and the word. The selfless life. It's one that says, you know what? I'm all in. See, if you're hurt, if you're offended, people are getting you down, you're the problem, not them. If you've got a problem with this guy and this guy and this guy, it's not them, it's you. I promise. What do you mean? <laughs> that should tell you. <laughs> I'm not being mean, I'm being real. Everybody's always got an issue why they can't. Jesus never had any. If anybody had the right to have attitude, it would have been him. He's perfect. Are you guys okay? Times of refreshing don't come from meetings. They come from him. 
We come from meeting Him. Meeting Him and establishing a deeper relationship. It doesn't matter where you were. What matters is that your heart sees it. When your heart sees it, that's where it's at, right there. I, and I've talked to people. I've, I've, I've had pastors publicly rebuke me because I think I know it all. Everything I'm sharing with you is true. And if you're a pastor, it lines up with the word. It's really sound. It's all about relationship. It's all about intimacy. It's not about saying you have one and not having one. Saying you're having one and not having one will burn you out. And saying you have one and not having one won't bring your kids to Jesus, I promise. Because they see it. And they don't want anything to do with it. I remember I was at, I was at Rhema. I was doing, they brought me in to do the pastor's conference last, in uh, 2013. And I shared my heart for a little while. And uh, when I came in there, nobody knew who I was. And I'm at Rama, And it's like, uh, who let him in here, you know? <laughs> I'm friends with Craig, and Craig's a friend of mine. I went there and shared, you know, when I got up there, lots of pastors sat back and, you know, and it's a pastor's conference. And it was, I'm, I'm saying all that because at the end of the session, you know, I went, out, I went outside, I was going back to my hotel. And this right here, just, it was, if that was the only reason I came, it was amazing. This guy follows me out the back door, and he goes, sir, I need you to stop. I'm like, oh man, I'm going to get it, because this guy's a seasoned, 30, year past, 30 years in pastoral ministry, and, he says, I need to talk to you right now. I go, yes, sir. And I can take it, man, because you ain't going to hurt me. I love you. You'll just, you'll just give me things to pray for. <laughs> really? And God will get you because he loves you. I'm not afraid. I've been rebuked, and it's okay. I've been rebuked on planes where people can't get away. <laughs> so the pastor looks at me, and he goes, I'm going to tell you something, son. And he gets in my face, and he goes, I've been a pastor 30 years, poking me in the chest. I said, man, that's awesome. He said, you see that boy over there? Points to his son across the parking lot. I said, yes, sir. He goes, that's my boy. He said, did you hear what I said? I've been a pastor 30 years. I said, yes, sir. He goes, I've been a father for none. And I went, oh. He said, I've been in pastoring, and I haven't been a father to my child. And I just, I said, man, he hates me. You see him, he hates me. What do I do now? He said, when you came out on that stage, I thought, what could this man possibly have for me, Lord? That's what he thought. And in three minutes, he was crying so hard, he cried for two hours. And his son's across the parking lot. I said, hey, man, come here. He goes, thanks a lot. See, God's all about restoring sons to the fathers and the fathers to the sons and the kids to the parents. Calling prodigals home. <laughs> He's awesome. If God could touch me, he could touch anybody. <clears throat> so this kid comes over. <clears throat> I said, hey, it's your dad, isn't it? He said, yes, sir. I said, man, I said, you know that, that he just told me he's been a pastor for 30 years, but he's not fathered you for any? He said, yes, sir. I said, what do you think about that, man? He looks at his dad. He said, Dad, I love you. I realize that tonight that my heart ain't been right. And I made you my enemy. I was my own enemy. <laughs> the pastor held his son. He was, Dad, I forgive you. I love you. And their relationship, 30 years, just like that in one moment of seeing that people aren't your enemy, people aren't your problem. Just admitting the fact that, wait a minute, I'm the problem. Because until you get to that place right there, God can't work with it. I promise, Jesus is powerful. I talk to people all the time. Because they're trying to be so strong. Do you know that your, your weakness is a magnet for the strength of God? 
You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Not through you white knuckle gripping this thing, trying to get it done. There's no grace for that. That's why pastors burn out, man. That's why people burn out, missionaries burn out, because they need, they need to be in control. They need to be this. I'm not saying like live loose. Gosh, the last thing the Holy Spirit wants you to do is live loose. He wants us to live holy. He wants us to walk godly. It's just about surrender to an amazing dad. He's the best dad ever. He's so awesome. And he loves us. It's like you have a daisy. He loves us. 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 I've been in love with Jesus for 10 years. He is in love with us, man. He says, seek first the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom? It's not meat or drink. But it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the kingdom's in the Holy Spirit. So seeking first the kingdom is relationship with the Holy Spirit. Everything, everything is encompassed within Him. Everything. Jesus spoke so highly of Holy Spirit. Sometimes we treat Him as a mist and a vapor. Hope He shows up. Man, He doesn't want to leave. He's God. The Holy Ghost awesome is that he's what gives us boldness you know people say well Todd you talk to people all the time you're an evangelist I'm a believer I'm a, I'm a son yeah but how do you like talk to everybody because they need to be sons they need to be daughters they have to be or they go to hell Everybody that you see is eternal. Yeah, but how can, what gives you your boldness? Righteousness. I'm right with God. I'm like right with my Father. The whole Old Testament was about what you had to do to be right. The whole New Testament is who you are because He did it. It's really that simple. Jesus fulfilled the law so that I could be made right with God. And if I'm supposed to seek first the kingdom, which is righteousness, peace, and joy. I, Romans 5.1, I've been justified by faith, therefore having peace with God. Righteousness gives me peace. It's the only thing that gives me peace. But it's not just peace that the world gives. Jesus says, I've come to give you peace that surpasses understanding. That peace, it's supposed to be that peace. It's His yoke. It's easy. His burden is light. That rest for our souls is ceasing from our works, entering into His rest and choosing not to go back. But it's relationship, it's intimacy, and it's the transformation of the mind so that I can prove His will. Everywhere I go, I am required to prove His will. I get to prove His will every day. Everywhere I go. It's not a hot potato. I don't know what it is. You check it. You see the will of God. I don't know his will. We have to know the will of God. We have to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. We have to know the will of the Lord. Do not be unwise, but know the will of the Lord. How can you know it? Relationship. Intimacy. Just like Jesus, he had relationship with his Father. It's for all of us. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. All it takes is just... <clears throat> One Holy Ghost defibrillator. Boom! That's it. That's all it takes. And your whole life changes. Overnight. In a moment. Just like that. It's not a process. It's submission. Here's the process. Okay. That's it. This is the process. Oh my gosh, I didn't see it. Lord, now I do. Repentance. Here's the process. It, it's all of this. Oh, okay. We complicate it. We make it like, you got to get through this, and then 10 years later, then maybe you'll get it. No, you can't afford to live for the next 10 years without rest. <laughs> It'll kill you. It'll take your sleep away, give you digestive problems, all that stuff, man. Come on. You guys all right? I got to tell you something that happened on my way back from Seattle. Huh? We okay? All right. 
Can I, t- can I tell you a couple testimonies and then we'll pray? You all right? You okay? Is this helping at all? We're going to tell you, it's only 8.30, man. <laughs> I did. I was at a church. You'd have been amazed, man. I was in Switzerland. And they told me I only had 30 minutes for four sessions. I did it. Mirror, see? I didn't study to come out here and talk. I just poured my heart out. God loves you guys so much, and I do too. It's just amazing. We can all walk like Jesus, man. Okay. So, I was out with, with Mr. Dan Hammer, Pastor Dan Hammer. I was out there, and we went to the gym. And uh, we were going to LA Fitness. And because I, I like to work out. And uh, I just won my Gold's Gym 12 week challenge. I just won it. So now I get to preach the gospel on the whole, like, essay. And I think I put my picture up with the essay beside it <laughs> about how I did it. And all the trainers are freaked out by my life. I pray for their people and they get healed in my gym all the time. Like, every day. A, a guy came up to me today at the gym and he goes, He said, Hey, man, how are you? I was talking to Dan on my headset. He didn't know. He comes up and he goes, how are you, man? I go, so good, dude. How are you? He goes, I ain't seen you in a little while. He says, no, I've been preaching, man. I was just in Norway and Poland and Switzerland and just got back. He goes, I bet it was amazing, man. I said, yeah, it sure was. I said, how, how's everything going? He goes, really good. First day I met him, he's working out, lifting. I said to him, I said, dude, I said, I don't know who you are, man. I said, but I know what I see. I saw you driving a police car. I saw you with a, a, you had a police hat on and stuff, and you're driving in the car, and out of the humility in your heart, you turned around, and you talked to the guy behind you that was in the back of your car, and you started telling him about Jesus. And the guy broke down and cried and gave his life to Jesus on the way to the police station. I said, that's an amazing thing. He goes, I'm a cop, man. I said, wow, isn't that awesome? He goes, that's really crazy, man, because I, I, I keep thinking I need to do that. I need to do that. I need to do that. I said, but you want to be a state trooper. You don't just want to do the the county that you're in. I said, man, even more than that, you want to be an FBI guy. He goes, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Who are you? I'm just a Christian. Yeah, but how? I'm just normal. What? That's just normal Christianity. I know my father. He knows everything about you. He loves you. Uh, Man, you're awesome. Can I give you a hug? Like, come on, man. Two, two dudes in the gym giving hugs. <laughs> and he tells all of his cop friends every time I come in, hey, man, how's it going? So I'm checking into LA Fitness. We're going out there, and he's going to get me a, a visitor's thing. And as we're, as we're checking in, I said hi to the lady, and she had a, I forget what's on her. What is it? Oh, yeah. No. Karma is a karma is a B. Okay, that's as far as I go. See, my conscience won't let me go there, dude. <laughs> it won't, because I can't do it. So she has a tattoo right here on her on the top of her collarbone right here. And I'm like, oh, I used to believe in karma. And I found out it didn't work for me. I needed Jesus. What? What? I said, yeah, oh, and there's a guy walking outside, so I followed him outside, and I had a word for him. So I walked out to him, he's a big bodybuilder, dude. I walked up on him, I go, hey, he goes, what? I said, easy, dude. (laughs) Chill out, man. I just had a word for you. He's like, what do you mean a word? What kind of word? I go, a word from the Lord. (laughs) Oh, great. Right? (laughs) Because he doesn't know. So I just said to him, I said, man, I, I said, I... And the same thing it had to do with police. I said, man, I said, I, I really feel like there's a call in your life to be a police officer, and I feel like something's really just pushed it away. And I don't know what you do in your life, but I really see leadership on your life, but you've always wanted to be. He goes, man, I thought he was getting mad. He goes, man, he goes, I was supposed to go in the Marines, man. I said, I used to be a Marine. <laughs> Thank you. 
He goes, my brother went in the Marines. He goes, and then my dad told me if I go in and both of you die, I can't carry on the family name. So I never did it. But man, I wanted to be a cop. I was going to go in and be in the MP, an MP and then come out and be a police officer. He goes, but now I work construction and I hate it. I go, man, what makes you think you can't be a police officer? He goes, man, you're giving me hope. I said, that's it. I'm an ambassador of hope too. I am. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ coming out of me is that hope being made manifest. He's like, man, you're really awesome, man. I said, dude, can I pray for you? He goes, sure. <laughs> it went from, hey, man, to sure. In like two minutes. Because God, the, the, the hand of a king is in the, or the heart of a king is in the hand of the Lord. God can just switch it. Just awesome. Like, like amazing. Just, whoa. If we'd stop being afraid. Perfect love. I know we know it, but if we know him, we won't be afraid anymore. I promise, because you can't kill me. Because he is the resurrection and the life. He who lives and believes in me will never die. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Really gain. Like super gain. Like mega gain. Like awesome. And I'm having an amazing time here. Amazing. And it's going to be better. I don't even think about what I'm going to have in heaven. I don't. Because why would I set my sights on that? I live there. I'm not building up mansion things. That's weird. I'm going to have a bigger mansion because of all the... <laughs> I just would be happy to lay on my face for a million years sing holy. That'll be good enough. Really? <laughs> okay. So I, this guy, I, I come back in and I said to her, I said, hey. I started talking to her. And I said, you're a mother, aren't you? She goes, yeah. I said, you got a little girl? And God showed me that she wanted to take her life. She wanted to be done with her life. Literally. And, and, he, and Dan was there. She, ah! <laughs> she burst into tears. She can't breathe. Right there at the counter. She's checking people in to the gym. People are coming in. The other guy, that bodybuilder dude, comes in. He starts taking the, here, I'll do it. Just go talk to him. <laughs> It's ridiculous. Awesome. So, you're going to be okay. I'm going to pray for you, honey. You need to give your life to Jesus right now. Okay. I promise. She prays with me. She gets born again. This thing just says later on, see you later. She gets saved. Jesus just touches her. She turns into a different girl. It was crazy. And then we, we gave her the address. She actually showed up on Sunday morning. Now you guys are pouring into her life. Mom made me cry today. Because you're pouring into her. She's a different girl. She said, I have something to tell you guys. What did she say? I got baptized before as a Mormon. I need to get rid of all that stuff. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> it's already cleaned out. She just needs to be enforced in who she is. Oh. So I was, I was coming back from your place. Something about Seattle, man. I was coming back. It was a red-eye flight. And uh, I'm on my way back, and, and we get on, get on the plane. And I sit beside this guy, and I, I got upgraded. Thank Jesus. <laughs> oh, I fly 300,000 miles a year, man. It's a big deal. <laughs> it really is. So I mean, it is. Because on that seat, you can go like, instead of like this, you can go like that. <laughs> it is, but it's a little bigger this way, and I'm not like this. So, so anyway, there's a med student beside me on this plane. So, like, he's got this, you know, before we take off, he's got his computer up, he's got the physics and stuff that I could never understand. Like, I... I just didn't understand anything. <laughs> the Bible's the first book, by the way, that I can understand in my whole life because it's meant for your heart. Because it's not meant for your brain. It's meant for your heart because your heart can take you places your brain can't fit. You are not that smart. <laughs> I'm telling you. Jesus is amazing. Okay. Are you guys okay? You all right? I'm going to share this testimony, and then I'm going to pray something, and then we're going to pray, all right? And then tomorrow morning, we're going to do it again. 
<clears throat> so the med student sitting there like looking at his stuff and I said, man, what do you do? Are you like a mad scientist or what? He says, no, I'm a med student. I go, wow. I said, that's amazing. God really gave you a gift, huh? He goes, yeah. And I said, man. He goes, what do you do? I said, I kind of practice medicine too. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, man, I said, we've seen amazing miracles, crazy stuff, man. People's eyes that are white forming pupils in them. He's like, what? I said, yeah, man, paralytics carrying up their wheelchairs to the stage in Africa. And what? I said, yeah, here's a picture. He goes, no way. It's a pile of wheelchairs on the stage. He's like, who are you? I said, I'm just a Christian, man. Well, I'm a Christian too. I've been one my whole life. I said, that's awesome. I said, you know that practicing medicine thing I was telling you about? He goes, yeah. I said, man, I said, how about your left knee and ankle? You're messed up. He said, what do you mean? I said, you heard it running. I said, in sports. He goes, yeah, my ankle's jacked right now. Dude, what's wrong with you? I said, it's not what's wrong, it's what's right. I said, Jesus lives in me, man. You're a Christian and the Holy Spirit lives in you too. The Spirit of Christ. Christ wasn't Jesus' last name. It wasn't Joseph and Mary Christ. <laughs> See, it's good news. It's not a bummer. It's good news. See, I start sharing testimonies and people are like, well, I don't know. Well, I live with me. I wouldn't lie to you. That's not my daddy. My father's not a liar. I promise you. And I don't have to lie. There's testimonies every day because Jesus is with me. He likes to hang out with me and he loves people and I love people. People aren't my problem. I was and then I died and now I'm not the problem anymore. And that's the key to success. <laughs> I should write a book. <laughs> One key to success, die. <laughs> uh, it's already taken, it's the Bible. <laughs> so this med student I go let me can I demonstrate dude he goes what do we do I said just let me pray for you so he goes oh okay <laughs> you know he doesn't know because because he's never been prayed for for like that before and a lot of the church doesn't believe in that because they've never seen it but if you would walk as an example they would if you wouldn't allow what people don't see to influence what you do see they would if you'd stop allowing people's sin against you to produce sin within you, they would. Stop being offended. Start living and walking in love and not worrying about how people treat you. They treated Jesus way worse. Okay. So I prayed for this guy, and as I'm praying for him, I have this word about his shoulder. I said, Father, I thank you for his left shoulder, God. I thank you that right now, God, his left shoulder will be healed. Jesus, you love him so much. Thank you, Father. Jesus' name. Amen. So I look at him, he's like, why is my body hot right now? I said, it's that practice medicine thing. He goes, this is crazy, man. Oh my goodness. And I said, man, it's, it's him. He loves you so much. He goes, yeah, but I never knew about this. I said, well, now you do. I said, imagine this, man. Imagine if you were in an operation, because you want to be a surgeon, right? Yeah? Dude! I said, imagine you open someone up, and you look inside, and when you go in there, you can't fix it. Like, and so doctors sew people back up and say, listen, it's way worse, and you know, we found this or this. What if you knew that this was available as a Christian? And you just put your hand with a rubber glove, because a rubber glove can't stop Jesus. I know surgeons, I know a cardiologist that's raised the dead here in America a few times. Jesus day. What if you lay your hands on them and just you got past the fear of all the people watching you because they knew that there's no hope. And all of a sudden, all that stuff went and disappeared right in front of their faces. What do you think would happen to your nurses? He said, they would lose it. 
I said, what do you think would happen to you? I would lose it. <laughs> I said, wouldn't that be awesome? He goes, yeah. I said, but you'd have to get past the fear of man. He goes, yeah. This is crazy, man. I, you've really given me a lot to think about. I said, could thinking make your shoulder and your ankle better? He said, no. I said, well, there's not much to think about there. <laughs> he goes, you're right. I, I'm kind of confused. <laughs> because this thing doesn't get it. This thing kicks at the door, trying to get in. Your heart's like, come on, follow me. Because your heart can take you places your brain can't fit. That's why men watch like a show and all of a sudden something like sad happens and they cry and then the wife looks at them and they wipe the tear. What? Because <laughs> their heart took them somewhere where their brain caught up then. <laughs> Simple. So we take off and we're up in the air and he has to get back to work and stuff and the flight attendant's coming back and saying, can I get you a drink? I'm like, yeah, I'll take a water. Man, Jesus loves you so much. Mm, thanks. You know, he's just not happy with the Jesus thing. So, so we go through and, and then about an hour and 20 minutes into our flight, I'm reading the Bible. Just, I'm in love with Jesus, man, on my planes. I cry like a mess. Like, oh my God. Like, listen to the word, watch it, listen, see it, devour it, live in it. And all of a sudden, the flight attendants are running up and down the aisle. And I'm like, what is going on here? Like, this is crazy. Like, our pitter patter, pitter patter, stomp, 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 like, the whole way back. And I'm like, I turn around and look, and there is a guy laying in the aisle, sideways, laying in the aisle. So the flight attendants come up front, is anybody on the plane with medical experience? The med student looks at me and he goes, <laughs> So a nurse, a nurse is back there. There's another EMT that's back there. The nurse, the nurse, the, there's two people already back there. He comes back and he goes, what kind of medical experience do you have? Well, I'm a Christian, man. I, Jesus lives in me. I want to pray for him, man. Oh, please. And he walks by me. The med student goes, dude, you need to make him listen. I go, maybe you should tell him. No, you tell him. You no, know, it's that fear of man thing. So I start, so he went by again. I tugged on his shirt. I said, please let me go back and pray for him, man. Sir, please stop. We are in a medical emergency right now. Now he's in a lifestyle that he's been bashed and pushed around and he does not like Christians at all. He's living a lifestyle that, that he doesn't like God in. And he's very, very angry at the whole Jesus thing. And so he walks by me again. I, I tap him on the shoulder again. And this is three times. The med student is getting like, you should probably stop now. <laughs> I said, man, please let me go pray for him. He goes, he goes, sir, you are offending people. I said, it, it doesn't matter, sir. I, I really want to pray for him because Jesus will heal him. Sir, enough. Now, now we're four. I went the whole way to ten. People up there in business were really not comfortable. But you are required to be uncomfortable for the comforter to show up. That's why he's called a comforter. <laughs> God like knew you were going to be uncomfortable. So he said, I think we'll give him this name. It will make sense to them. <laughs> so finally he goes, sir. I said, no, now that's enough. If you want me to pray with you, I will pray with you. I said, awesome. He said, I am not praying with you. And he got mad and walked up front. <laughs> so I said to the med student, true story, man. Just like, when were we there? February? Just a little bit. I said to the med student, I said, dude, we need to pray for, we need to pray for that guy to get healed right now without going back there. So you pray with me? He goes, so I said, Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God, that you would get that man off the floor right now. God, I thank you in Jesus' name. In one minute, he's walking. Watch. He comes up. Now, I am in, I am in like the veil. You know the veil? 
I'm in front of the veil, and there's a bathroom right behind it. And the door opens up like this. That nurse comes up with him, and he's in the bathroom. And I said, man, and the flight attendant's up front in the galley. I unhook my, and I said, I'm on my side of the veil. I did not go on the other side. Because I don't want to ruin a testimony, as, as important as it is. Everybody is watching, and I'm not in a place of trying to... You can really ruin a testimony. That's all I can say. You can, in the name of Jesus, really mess stuff up. And everybody's at stake. So I want to be conscious of everybody, not living by the fear of man, but making sure that I honor the head, and that flight attendant's the head. So I cannot go back there. So I'm not going to go back there, but he's up here. So I said to the nurse, I said, can you do me a favor, please? She goes... Yeah, what? I said, can you tell that man in the bathroom right now that I love Jesus with all my heart and that I need to pray for him right now and if he'll let me, Jesus will take this whole thing away right now. She goes, amen. The nurse did. I'm like, all right. So she tells the other lady, she tells the man in the bathroom, there's a man and the man doesn't answer. So I put my arm behind the veil. I said, hey man, give me your hand right now. Hurry. Because the flight attendant's coming. I'm so serious. Now all, the, now all the people around me are totally freaked out. Not a little bit. We're talking about a guy that's pressed the issue again and again and again. I wouldn't press it if I didn't believe it. There are Christians on the plane, but they're 007 Christians. It's true. I've been around them all my life in Christ. But if somebody doesn't step out, so I pray for this guy, and his eyes go, what's going on? I said, amen, man. I said, you're a Christian? He goes, yeah, what just happened? I said, Jesus just healed you, man. That's what happened. He goes, praise God. The nurse is like, all right. I turn around, flight attendant's behind me. He has an air tank and an oxygen mask. And he's like, I told you to stand down. And he's yelling at me. Not like, now, sir, listen. I'm talking like this. I told you to stand down. Now I'm going to get the captain, and we're going to have the authorities remove you off of this plane. Because they turned the plane around. They're flying back to Seattle because the flight attendant was pinned underneath this guy. So there was two people. I could only see one. So now he's threatening to have me kicked off the plane. So be it, dude. Amen. If I have to go, I have to go. But I'm not going to bow out to some demonic stuff, man. I'm going to live for Jesus every day. This is one. I have thousands of testimonies like this. Because it's pretty confrontational and very intense. On planes especially because you're locked in a steel tube at 35,000 feet with people. <laughs> so the flight attendant is, I told you to stand down, screaming at me. Everybody's like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. The med student is like... <laughs> but his shoulder and his ankle and his knee are better so he's got to deal with that trying to process all that trying to wrap his head around it and he's watching me get seriously blasted by this flight attendant but that flight attendant's soul is at stake see that's the way I think every day people's souls are at stake people in front of me are eternal they're either going to hell or they're going to heaven now, I can either be an influence of heaven or an influence of hell upon their life. Silence is, an, is a hellish influence. Hellish. And people are going to hell because of it. Because people are afraid because they've got the mindset of hell. They've got the mindset of a devil that's afraid that today might be trumpet time. Today might be his last day. He doesn't know. So he's trying to mess everybody's head up and get them to think like him. Christians that are headed to heaven but thinking like hell while they're here. Basket-headed Christianity. It's not okay, man. You do not have to be an evangelist. You just have to believe. You have to be a believing believer. One that believes more than just to get to heaven, but that heaven got into you and repossessed you for purpose to represent him, to stomp hell for a living daily. Ah, that felt great. So the airline attendant is freaking out on me. The nurse looks at him and says, you stand down to the airline attendant. She said, he said, I don't want to hear any more about this Jesus. She said, well, I'm a believer. The, 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 the nurse on the plane. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> you know what she said? 
She said, I thought that you wanted this man better. You didn't want him better. If you wanted him better, you'd be happy because look at him. He's healed. He's standing behind her. I'm good. <laughs> the flight attendant goes, ugh, and he walks up front. I'm talking veins popping out of his head. Very mad. He goes up into the galley. He's up in there, and I sit down in my seat, and the med student won't even talk. I said, hey. He goes, yeah, uh-huh, no. Shh, shh, shh. I said, listen, man. I said, I was a drug addict for 22 years, man. Nobody walked like Jesus in front of me. I said, the Bible's full of persecution. People died for their faith. They got crucified. They got burned at the stake. They had their skin peeled away from their body. Doubting Thomas was filleted, man. They peeled his skin away. Doubting Thomas was changed into a different man. Something happened to him. Something happened to Peter, the one that denied Jesus. Something happened to Peter to make him a different man. Something happened to these guys that changed them into different men. And we have the same Holy Spirit accessible, the same one that's available for a selfless Christianity. The same one. The same one. And all you have to do is be humble enough to say, God, I just want this in my life. And he comes because he's amazing. All he wants to do is put you on fire. Do you know when someone's on fire and they go through the trial, they go through the fire, nothing changes. You just come out with a sharper, crisper, more awareness of his presence, of his goodness, and a more thankful heart because he's the one that was in there with you. And the devil wishes he never did it because you come out with a sharper, more crisper awareness of who he really is. But he's not used to that. He's used to touching Christians and getting them to blame God. So this guy goes up front. I sit there. I say, come on, man, pray for me. Let's pray for that guy. He said, uh, you go ahead. All right. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God. I thank you for his heart. Thank you for his life. I thank you that you love him so much, God. Jesus, you're awesome. Thank you. Amen. People hear me. They act like they don't on planes, but they do. <laughs> Put their newspapers up. All kinds of stuff. You can't get away. Holy Spirit's a big boy. So in one minute, that airline attendant comes back and gets in my face again. He's like, this far away from me. I said, yes, sir. I was ready. Just bring it. Just give it to me. He goes, sir. I said, yes, sir. He goes, I was wrong. Would you please forgive me? Right there on the plane. I said, I wasn't mad at you. He goes, no, listen to me right now. I shouldn't have treated you like that. You're a good person. And I was really wrong. And I'm really sorry. I said, man, I said, of course I forgive you. He goes, thank you, sir. And he puts his cheek on my cheek and he holds me and won't let me go. <laughs> Listen, see, sometimes, see, we see things in the natural. We need to see things through God's eyes, man. We need to see people through the eyes of the Father. This is a real thing, a real thing. And happened in front of everybody. He goes, I so appreciate your heart, and I thank you so much. He goes, you do forgive me. I said, of course I do, man. I was never mad at you. He goes, thank you. With tears in his eyes, he walked back up front. The med student looks at me, he goes, I have never seen anything like this <laughs> in my life, ever, ever. I said, welcome to Christianity, man. Do you want it? He said, I am one, but I haven't realized what it means. I said, what means this? You lay down your life. Greater love hath no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friend. This is normal Christianity, man, that all of you, all of you have access to. All of you. Stop living for you. Just, just stop. Just make, a, just make a position in your heart. I'm not going to do this anymore. So we get to the ground. And we pull back into the Seattle airport. We pull up to the gate. And I said, hey man, listen. When we hit the ground, there are going to be authorities coming on this plane. I said, they might take me off. If they don't, and they're just paramedics, because they've got to get the airline attendant off the plane. When they go by me, we're praying for them. He says, <laughs> so just the ambulance people came on the plane. They came down. They got this lady. 
I stopped him. I said, sir, I need to pray for her right now. He says, okay. I asked the airline attendant, give me your hand. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God, that you touch her right now. Jesus, thank you for your love for her. She started crying. She goes, thank you for caring about me. I said, oh, honey, God cares about you so much. She goes, I'm a Christian. Thank you. The, am the ambulance guy, he goes, amen. Pulls her off the plane. The med student and everybody is like, let me get off this plane right now. <laughs> oh, I promise. I walked that med student down. We had two hours in the airport. They put us in the hotel. I went to the hotel, worked out for two hours, came back, got my plane home. But anyway, <laughs> I wanted to share this with you. One week after that, I get an email. I didn't tell anybody my name. I just, I don't like it. She says, hello, Mr. White. This came to Lifestyle Christianity, to the ministry. I was the nurse who joined you in praying for the guy who passed out on our flight last week from Seattle to Chicago. I just wanted to tell you how much of an impact this had not only on me, but on everybody I shared the story with. I think it's hilarious how I found out who you were. After 24 hours later, I arrived to my mission trip in Jamaica. And I told everybody about what happened, and I highlighted about this white guy with beautiful treads. She goes, I don't even know why I felt like describing you, that you came up saying how much you love Jesus and you wanted to pray for him. Right away, another girl on the mission trip that just came from Sweden said, it has to be Todd White. <laughs> she said, we want to be so she said, our group was inspired to be just like you. We want to be so radical that somebody will just barely describe us and automatically, because of our love for Jesus, they will know who we are. She said, I know this might not be the right place to tell you, but I thought that, that you'd like to know, even in that delay, God had a purpose, and that purpose was for me. Personally, I was stirred to make sure that I pray for people just as readily as I want to use my RN skills. David and Goliath. There was a whole army that was petrified. They were afraid. David, David knew who God was. He knew who God was. And he came there, and his own brothers mocked him. Said that he was full of pride, but he wasn't. He was full of knowing him. He killed the lion and the bear when no one was looking. He comes out there, and everybody's shaking. And David, because he knew God, he grabbed a stone, which I believe is Christ. And he took that stone, and that, that, that enemy mocked David. But really... He said, the battle's not mine. The battle's the Lord's. And David charged that giant. And when he charged that giant, and he threw that rock, which I believe was Christ, and that Holy Spirit, which is the wind, drove that rock deep into the forehead of that giant. That giant hit the ground. Every scared army member, every scared, every scared person in the army, everyone was petrified. They were all petrified, including Saul, which should have been the one to fight him. Everyone was petrified. They saw David pick up the sword and hack off that giant's head. He lifted up that head, and the army charged because of a fearless boy who knew his father. And we, as the church, need to step up, pick up a sling, pick up a stone, have faith in our God, trust in our God, be an example, so that the rest of the army could run. Because as pastors and leaders, if you would lead from this angle, your people would get wrecked. And if they don't believe, just take them out to lunch and watch them. Demonstrate. Just demonstrate Jesus.
For years and years and years, I've known Jesus this way. I've not known another Jesus. This is the only one I read about in the Bible. The whole New Testament talks about this being your portion. You. Your portion. God wants to infuse us with faith. He wants to infuse us with strength. He wants to infuse us with boldness. I want everybody to stand up, please. The worship team, come up here. Could you guys all do it? Are they? Sorry, man. Thank you. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching the video. We came up with a website. It's called Lifestyle Christianity. We have our newsletter that's going to go out. You can sign up for our email list. We also have testimonies on there, event schedule, all that stuff. It'll be amazing. We want to empower a generation to walk Christianity as a lifestyle so we can all walk with the power of God on a constant basis. It's going to be awesome. So come on over. Bless you. Thanks for watching.